I just wanted to welcome you all here. I'm John Cabana, and I direct the Institute for Policy Studies. And we've been working on the Philippines really for 35 years. We were very involved in the 1980s in work uh, to help groups in this country and in the Philippines that were fighting the Marcos dictatorship. Um, and got involved among other things. I was just remembering with some of our Filipino friends uh, actions down at the World Bank and IMF in 1985 and 1986 when Marcos was asking for massive loans from those institutions and going and meeting with executive directors there to explain to them why this was not a good investment. Um, <clears throat> and we continued that work in the 1990s. We did a lot of work on um, uh, work with groups in the Philippines that were fighting for the environment and did a big study that culminated in a book that <clears throat> I want to give Senator Trianis, but which is called Plundering Paradise, the Struggle for the Environment in the Philippines. <clears throat> and we've continued that work with many of those groups up to today. Um, I was there last summer working with groups in the Philippines that are fighting against big mining companies there. Um, but, and we also, we have, for those of you who don't know, we have a terrific uh, weekly newsletter called Foreign Policy in Focus, which is commentary on the rest of the world. And every other month we have a commentary by another former congressperson from the Philippines, Walden Bellio, who's been one of our associates over the years. And then finally, and Sanjo will say a word about this, we've, Sanjo Tree, who runs our drug policy program, has been at the front lines of challenging U.S. drug wars in other countries in Colombia and elsewhere for for over two decades and has over the past year uh, brought the Philippines into his work um, partly to try to raise the prospect of alternative approaches to the drug problem that don't involve killing thousands of people and that work. Uh, so it's uh, worth we're Honored to have you here, Senator Trianis, and I do, let me turn it over to Sam just so we can give you a talk. Uh, thank you, John. It's uh, an honor to welcome you all here, and especially Senator Trianis. Um, I had an introduction all prepared, and then last night, about midnight, I saw a tweet from the Senator, uh, and then lots of other tweets um, from news organizations about the International Criminal Court coming down with a recommendation to open a preliminary investigation uh, into crimes against humanity by President Duterte in his drug war. Uh, and of course, uh, Senator Trianis is one of the uh, petitioners uh, on that complaint. Uh, so uh, this adds, it puts a whole new spin on, on today's uh, events. And if there are any journalists here, I'm sure there'll be some questions about that. Um, but in terms of the war on drugs, uh, I've been working on 20 years now looking at international and domestic drug policies in various countries. Um, Colombia, Mexico, Bolivia, Afghanistan, Thailand, New Zealand, uh, and in the past year and a half, the Philippines. Uh, trying to learn, uh, trying to apply some of the lessons from other drug wars to, to this situation, um, and to look at some of the underlying uh, drivers uh, in, in this drug war, um, which in many ways, it, it, it reminds me of a, of a pogrom, um, much like the czarist pogroms of the 19th century in, in Russia and Eastern Europe, where um, they would scapegoat a cornucopia of social ills, many of which are structural in nature, and identify a scapegoat uh, segment of the population. In this case, it was Jews back then. Um, and the term scapegoating literally comes from the Old Testament, where the, uh, the priest or the rabbi would confess the, the sins of the village onto a goat and literally drive the goat into the desert and voila, they'd be cleansed. And this reminds me of, of much of what President Duterte has been doing with the drug war. It's really not about drugs so much as demonizing a group of people uh, and, and pinning all these social ills on them and saying, if we only got rid of this group, uh, it, things would be wine and roses again. And uh, that has been the case with the drug war in so many countries around the world. Um, uh, but it also, as Senator Trianis said earlier, uh, we were talking, it's, it's also about intimidating uh, the opposition, that if we're willing to kill this many people. Uh, and by Human Rights Watch's count, over 12,000 people have been killed. Other accounts put it, put it higher. But if you take that number, it's roughly on an average of one death per hour since President Duterte has taken office. So that's a staggering death toll. Um, and we can't even begin to count the numbers accurately anymore. Al Jazeera uh, did some good reporting and interviewed uh, one of the, uh, the, the, the hitmen that was disposing of bodies and dumping them in, in Manila Bay, weighted down. So if you can't even find corpses anymore, it's hard to keep an accurate count. 
So in that context, <laughs> it's a pleasure to welcome one of the uh, few senators who's willing to speak out in the Philippines in, a, in an increasingly small space left to, to, to oppose President Duterte's policies. Um, and Senator Trianis uh, has a long and interesting history in uh, how he's come to serve in the Senate. Um, uh, there's a, a nice Wikipedia page on it, it's quite complicated. I'll let him explain some of that if he likes. Uh, but uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to welcome Senator Trianis. Thank you very much, uh, Sano and John, and uh, to everyone. It's really an honor to be uh, invited here at uh, IPS. Uh, well, let me go uh, straight to the point. Uh, we're here to talk about the, the ongoing drug war of, uh, of Mr. Duterte. I totally agree with uh, Sano's uh, 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 analysis that uh, about the scapegoating, scapegoat, uh, is this the term? Well, in, in, my, uh, in our analysis, it's uh, similar. Duterte basically created a, a demand for himself. Because looking at the statistics uh, from our uh, drug enforcement agencies, the drug problem in the Philippines, well, it's a serious problem, uh, just like uh, any in, in, in other countries. But compared to the global average of around 5%, the Philippines has, um, uh, was this, only 1.8% of the population that are um, in a way exposed to illegal drugs. And this number includes the one-time users, the recreational users, the marijuana users, and only 100,000 Filipinos are really hooked on drugs. And that's, uh, what, 0.1% uh, of the population. That's, that's still um, a significant number. But again, compare it to other countries, it's way down there. So um, the, what Duterte did early on was to magnify his problem, elevate his problem as the biggest, and in some cases, the only problem in the country. And uh, a lot of Filipinos bought that because uh, everyone, um, every family uh, would know of somebody or related to somebody who is dependent on uh, illegal drugs. And then uh, he created this uh, scenario wherein uh, your kids might be a victim of uh, these uh, drug crazed individuals and they may end up getting raped or chopped or whatever. Then he keeps on uh, repeating this anecdote about uh, drug addicts raping two-year-olds or he keeps on telling these stories, and he's very effective in uh, delivering those uh, uh, those stories. He was able to convince them. Um, well, during the campaign, we were a actually asking him, "What's what's the plan?" There was no holistic plan to address uh, illegal drugs. It was just about killing. We will kill them, kill them all. So. Uh, he was able to convince a lot of Filipinos that um, the killing of uh, these uh, drug addicts are justified. And uh, he was able to do that. Uh, we were the Filipinos, regardless whether we are a Catholic nation, we, we set aside those uh, uh, moral values taught to us early on in life, just so we can have a quick fix. And that's the road to victory for uh, Mr. Duterte. Of course, we can add on uh, the fact that he is a master of uh, propaganda, deception, and later on through technology, the, the troll, um, um, troll farms. And uh, back then, in uh, 2016, the phenomenon of fake news wasn't really uh, when exposed, exposed yet, so people just chewed on whatever the the social media uh, would uh, turn out. So that's uh, the key to 
we still look at the success. So, but from day one, I, I was really hoping because uh, as early as April of um, 2015, we were able to profile him, um, really uh, study uh, everything about him. And uh, this included our one-on-one -on -one conversation um, because I didn't really know Mr. Duterte personally. I was uh, also a victim of uh, the effective propaganda of Duterte that he's a man of action and he can uh, deliver um, results. So when I was, uh, when the group decided to make me run for vice president, he was one of the the uh, principles that uh, we actually uh, uh, explored. So that meeting happened. It was an exploratory uh, meeting. And uh, but at the onset of that meeting, Duterte said, "I'm not running. Uh, I'm not interested in running." Period. That was April of 2015. He kept on denying that he would run. Actually, it was just part of the plan. Anyway, since he said that he, he wasn't running, the uh, the supposed exploratory talks turned into a uh, just a casual conversation. We were picking uh, each other's brains. So on, on my part, I wanted to to get to know the man. I wanted to get some ideas out of him. But uh, from uh, in that more than an hour, probably an hour and a half meeting. He never talked about the country or any policy. What he talked about are the people he killed and how he killed them. So apparently he was trying to impress me and uh, being a former soldier, he thought that uh, I'd get uh, some high in uh, such conversations. But um, so he kept on going. He was describing graphic uh, details of uh, how he executed personally some some of his people so he wanted or he hoped that he created a positive impression out of that conversation but um, the effect was the opposite I figured that this man uh, is sick he has this psyche of a hitman uh, a mercenary so uh, I came out of that meeting and reported to our group that we can't possibly have this guy uh, as president of the country or in any capacity. So anyway, she, she said that he wasn't running, so we moved, we moved on. Um, until eventually, he declared um, after the deadline of the yeah. submission. That bought him um, uh, one full month or six months if you count the, the the time that the other candidates declared. He got a good six months uh, wherein he wasn't uh, really scrutinized. So that's part of the of the deception. But when he did, we started compiling uh, the dossiers and, and the, um, uh, about him. And uh, we came up with this um, the psychological report of, I don't know if you, you, you saw that, during his uh, annulment case, um, part of that, uh, of the evidence uh, submitted by the wife, uh, was this psychological report made by uh, a professional psychologist. And it defined there how Duterte actually thinks. It was so sickening if you would read the narrative there um, to include some sexual uh, fetish, uh, whatever. So it describes the man. So we we just saw what the, the kind of monster that we're dealing with. And then he started talking about killing, killing. And uh, based on uh, the information we're getting from Double City, um, that's what he, he actually did. He killed the people and based on what he told me. So eventually, um, 
we stumbled upon some uh, documents that, that detailed his uh, illegal bank transactions or ill-gotten wealth. And uh, I didn't expect that. We, we had an idea that he was a strong man, but he never, we never had an idea that he was that corrupt, that level of corruption, because we saw billions of pesos coming into his accounts. So we really went out uh, to open the eyes of the Filipino pe people uh, during that campaign period that you can't vote for this guy. He's sick. But eventually, uh, through effective propaganda, he won. Now, similar to the Davao template, wherein when he assumed office as mayor back in 1987, he launched this anti-war, uh, anti, uh, what's this? Um, anti-crime anti -crime or war against crime and illegal drugs campaign. Not really to, to eradicate crime, but to control every segment of, uh, of uh, society yeah, or in, uh, in the city of Davao. He created that environment of fear. He started killing people and the word, word got around that Duterte kills people. Okay, uh, initially petty criminals, but then when uh, some people started opposing him, he started killing them as well. So that effectively crushed any form of uh, check, and, check and balance in the city of Davao. So that's how he tried. He didn't really have any vision in Davao City. If, you, if you've been to Davao, you compare it to an adjacent city like General Santos. General Santos City is more, more peaceful, more organized, but because of effective propaganda and that was his brainwashing. Uh, he was able to convince the people of Davao that Davao City was actually the best and the safest in the world. When contrary to, to uh, the data, that Davao City, as late as December of 2015, is actually number one in uh, murder incidents and number two in rape incidents in the whole Philippines. So actually, based on statistics, Davao City is the most dangerous city in the Philippines. But he was able to convince the people of Davao that it's the, num it's the safest city, not only in the Philippines, but in the world. Now, I can compare it to the kind of uh, subtle brainwashing that's happening in, let's say, North Korea. When you ask North Koreans, uh, probably they say that uh, North Korea is a paradise. So that's how Duterte was able to do that. In terms of uh, crushing illegal drugs, he never crushed illegal drugs in Davao City. And the proof of that was when he started this uh, uh, Oplan Tokhang or War on Drugs, uh, his policy, um, there were thousands of surrenders in Davao City. So how did it happen? If he was really successful in his approach, then there shouldn't be any uh, uh, surrenders. And worse, we have uncovered um, at least four incidents wherein there was uh, a shipment of cocaine coming from another country and the port of Davao, which he controls, was being used as a transshipment point to Western, uh, Western countries. And it was cocaine. Um, cocaine was being uh, uh, shipped in and out of uh, Davao, whom he controls. And based later on, which we found out from uh, the witnesses like uh, Matobato and Las Cañas, they admitted that uh, they were being asked to uh, release uh, drug suspects and uh, to include their shipment. So this war on drugs is a sham. He is using this as a front to endear himself to uh, the general public by scaring them first, then presenting himself as the uh, savior. 
as the solution to their uh, all of their uh, fears. So that's what he does. When you ask him any um, anything deeper than killing uh, Filipinos, he won't come up with any solution to the illegal drugs. He just keeps on repeating that you need to kill them. There, uh, when you use um, what was that methamphetamine or shabu, it will fry your brains. I don't know. He, he keeps on repeating that anecdote uh, that it will fry your brains. They will rape your children. So you just kill them. So fast forward now as president, he employed the same time. Because this guy, again, based on the profile, the psychological profile that we got, he is a narcissist. Okay, he is a narcissist and uh, he is paranoid. So he is averse to any form of criticism. In Davao City, he ruled like a king. Nobody dared to criticize him. And though the few who did, uh, they ended up getting killed. So that's the kind of environment that uh, he wanted. So. The idea is to set up a totalitarian uh, environment so that uh, he can start uh, brainwashing them through media, through certain anecdotes, similar to what he did in, uh, in Davao. And uh, he's probably assumed that at some point, once he's successful, then everybody will just worship him. So that's, uh, that's the plan. There was never any economic uh, plan to uplift the lives of the Filipino people. There was no national security uh, plan to address the threats to security. No, it was just plain and simple bully tactics. I'm gonna kill you if you cross me. And in fact, his bluster um, in the, the Marawi, uh, prior to the Marawi siege, in fact, caused the destruction of, of that city. He dared the terrorists to come down and burn Marawi and be, because I will meet you and uh, crush you here. December 2016. Yeah. He said that. And of course, we know the capability of the armed forces. It's stretched too thinly. Uh, and uh, we won't be able to defend uh, all corners of the country. So. They took advantage of that, and they, uh, the terrorists, um, uh, was this, accepted the challenge, and they destroyed that city. So Duterte um, felt good about that because it played into his plan of creating chaos so that he can justify uh, more strong arm. Uh, One young measure. Yes, uh, the this. Um, the, uh, what's this? the draconian uh, measures to further control uh, the Philippines. So that's that's his plan. Now going back to the war on drugs, he kept at it for uh, a good uh, year and a uh, few months, and uh, the killing machine was so efficient. They were killing uh, more than a thousand uh, a month and by our count and based on the report of uh, of uh, the Philippine National Police they killed 4,000 um, people as a result of their what they call legitimate police operations every single case was about a victim resisting arrest drawing a gun then uh, <laughs> getting killed in the process. Same story. It's the same story, and they they keep on, um, uh, but, but then we have rules of engagement, even in law enforcement. You don't shoot to kill right away. You shoot to disable. The response should be commensurate to, to uh, the, the threat. Assuming that these incidents are true, but we know that uh, Probably 99% of these incidents were staged by the, the policemen. And we have witnesses, we have documents, uh, we have documented uh, some of these incidents wherein 
is just plain and simple summary execution. And some caught on CCTV. Some caught on CCTV. That particular incident uh, that involved this teenager uh, blew this thing wide open. And um, while the initial pushback was only coming from Senator Dilima, myself, and uh, Senator Ontiveros, but um, eventually, because of this, uh, the general public um, felt it was it was too much. For the first year, they were looking the other way, trying to compartmentalize that portion of uh, uh, that moral dilemma, hoping it will go away. But this thing blew up uh, in everybody's faces, and then uh, Duterte was forced to put, to to step back. And uh, the killing machine eventually, because of the pushback coming not only from uh, uh, the domestic, uh, the, the opposition coming, uh, uh, or domestically, but the opposition came also from the international community. So it forced him to retreat. So the killing machine uh, slowed down considerably, but uh, Based uh, again on uh, our last count, it reached from 4,000 4, from the police operations, then another 16,000 uh, 16, deaths were documented by the Philippine National Police, uh, and they claim it, claimed it as homicides with, for unknown reasons. These are the bodies that uh, uh, just ended up uh, uh, in the sidewalks. So, right now, that's where we are. But Duterte still is determined to, to push, uh, to actualize his, uh, his plan of, uh, of creating a totalitarian uh, regime. So he shifted to the media, the uh, Supreme Court, uh, even the Ombudsman, and uh, in, the, in Congress, he, he did this by uh, fabricating evidence against uh, an incumbent senator, Senator Laila Bilima, and she was put away. Uh, it, the purpose of that is not only to get back at Bilima for uh, investigating him when he was still mayor, but at the same time to send a chilling message to the other uh, members of Congress. So he filed uh, his allies filed an impeachment case against the uh, Supreme Court justice. So he's uh, he's all over the place. He's undermining the different democratic institutions, and uh, basically, we what we have is a creeping uh, dictatorship, which um, we feel uh, by Duterte's own timeline. We analyze that he's uh, going for uh, he's going to pull the trigger within the next uh, few months, until probably a year uh, at most. So that's very. Can I ask a clarifying question? Uh, when Duterte pulled back on the drug war, uh, roughly in November, was it or, or so last year? Uh, it was partly in response to the the outrageous killings of these teenagers, the caught on CCTV and all this stuff but also it was uh, heading into the ASEAN meetings uh, and the international media would descend on, on the Philippines and President Trump was coming. Uh, do you think that might have been part of the reason they, they pulled back a bit because of the, to take the heat off of uh, while the media were, were in town, the international media? Well, uh, you're, you're, you're right, actually. We, we saw the two, two possible motivations for them to, to uh, what's this? Uh, Push it will be post bottom on, on that uh, war on drugs, but um, it's more of the the uh, that incident that was uh, caught on uh, CCTV that uh, really made him uh, reverse his course because before that he was telling uh, the public or the policemen in general that I will take care of you. Uh, if they will file cases against you, I will absolve you. But in the case of these teenagers, um, it 
drop them like a hot potato. And uh, based on our uh, uh, soundings on the ground, a lot of policemen were were dismayed by uh, by what he did because he um, he dropped them, he left them hanging. So when uh, Duterte eventually wanted to revive the killing machine, um, it, it's quite difficult to to start uh, or to restart the uh, the momentum. So that's, uh, but it doesn't mean that the killing has uh, has stopped. We have noticed, uh, we have observed the killings are happening in, in areas uh, under PNP commanders who have been identified to be part of this, uh, uh, this uh, syndicate. And most of them we have already included in the filing of the ICC. So we have identified them, but uh, uh, apparently uh, they're still at it. The uh, issue with the PNP, the Philippine National Police, um, we see lots of stories of corruption, of extortion, kidnapping, uh, all these things because there's so little uh, accountability <coughs> and, and uh, impunity, great impunity. Uh, one of the, I think, underreported stories here is it involves gender and involves rape. Uh, and there's an article in the back there uh, by uh, this NGO from Toronto called RINGE, stands for Rape is No Joke. Uh, and it's a, a good piece on a, on a, sorry, uh, on a phenomenon I think is very underreported for the specific reason that um, women are being, uh, uh, you know, uh, forced to prostitute themselves to police or to hitmen, to assassins, uh, because their loved ones may end up on, on the watch list um, and might get killed as a result of that. Uh, and it gives these police or other gunmen tremendous leverage over these women to either uh, perform sexual favors for them in exchange for not killing their son, their husband, their lover, their, their you know, or, or father, uh, and they're in no position to file any charges after the fact because who are you going to talk to? The same people who threatened to kill your loved one to begin with. Uh, so I think it's a very underreported story. I wonder if you could talk more about the, the lens of gender and all this and the corruption within the PNP. Um, we, we had similar uh, information about it uh, in some cases. They would arrest uh, these uh, supposed uh, drug users and uh, since they can't afford to post bail and they're not even reported yet so that they if they decide to kill them uh, it's not reported in the, the police blotter so for some uh, if the, the the wife or the girlfriend is attractive enough then they get uh, to do sexual favors in exchange for the for the release so these things are happening and the worse uh, in some cases, uh, so much worse. The uh, the targets eventually um, got uh, since this the the killing was so the rate of the killing was so fast early on. At some point, they were running out of targets, so they need to come up with targets because there was a ransom uh, or was this a reward per system head. per head. This, this information was revealed to us by uh, uh, Mr. Las Cañas because when they were doing it in Abo City, that's the system they did. Uh, they, they did. And uh, at the national level, it's the same thing. If uh, you get a certain number of kills, say 10 kills a day, there is a corresponding uh, uh, reward for that. They call it reward, but it's actually um, uh, some form of uh, mercenary uh, bounty. service, a bounty. So, s since the the list in the first place was arbitrarily written, there was no validation at all being done. So, once they get in inside the house, and the target, uh, the supposed target is not there, they would just kill the brother or the father, and report it as one of the kills. So that they claim, they, they can claim those, uh, uh, the respective uh, bounty. And that uh, alone is wrong in so many levels. 
it has destroyed basically the police as an institution, the the due process, rule of law, and uh, you get to to terrorize the uh, the community. Can you explain the watch list system and how that how these lists are developed and what uh, happens to people? The uh, barangay officials, the neighborhood, uh, the neighborhood uh, uh, officials are obliged to list uh, suspected drug users and pushers. There is no way that the this, this that these names are are um, validated uh, and they submit it. And at some point it's given to the police or their uh, agents or uh, uh, mercenaries. Because some policemen um, felt the the, the killing uh, was too much for them, killing uh, innocent people, but they're being forced to come up to meet certain uh, quotas, so they would need to kill. So they would hire certain uh, agents or mercenaries, and they split the bounty. So the, these uh, mercenaries would get to do the dirty work. Uh, and they just uh, claim part of the bond. So it's about $400 a hit, I think, uh, according it, to some journalists. It, it, it depends. It depends, actually. But the, the hit is now uh, the uh, it's going outside the list, per se. The, these are contract uh, um, assassinations. They would kill, let's say, um, uh, an opponent or, or a business rival or a, another, uh, what's this, Bo a boyfriend of uh, one of their uh, love interests. And um, uh, they will just include them or just name them as a drug user later on after they get killed. And could drug gangs also in, uh, snitch on rival drug gangs to get them killed under this, these circumstances if there's no investigation? Could it be used, could the system be used to settle old scores of jealousy, revenge, as well as, as expanding drug influence, perhaps? Okay, um, here's the thing. The, the difference, I believe, with the drug operations in the Philippines and uh, in other countries is there are no drug gangs in the Philippines. It's only drug lords who employ mainly policemen, who employ um, agents who run things for them. So there, there is no competition. They monopolize uh, the whole uh, drug trade in their respective areas. So that's, uh, we, we have yet to encounter uh, real uh, drug lords with their own private armies clashing with one another, similar to what they have in, let's say, Mexico or Colombia. We don't have that in the Philippines. Because the drug lords can simply pay off the dirty policemen. And they have, uh, they can operate above ground. Um, yes. Uh, <clears throat> has there been any uh, recent criminological research on the impact of uh, of Duterte's uh, anti-drug campaign and other policies. Uh, you know, many people in the Philippines believe uh, he's made them safer. Uh, uh, but is there any hard analysis, data, documenting just what has happened? Well, uh, that's part of the propaganda of the diehard uh, you know, the Duterte um, uh, camp. That, uh, if these policies have made Philippines a safer place. But uh, after uh, what they've seen, um, it, it, it doesn't uh, wash. Uh, nobody's buying that. Of course, their, their supporters are buying that. They're trying to spread it. But um, these urban poor areas um, would privately or quietly say that uh, they're fearful okay. of, uh, of the policemen and, uh, and the chemists. But there's no uh, definitive study yet of the impact. 
and uh, probably if we can cite as proof, Davao. Davao, Duterte wasn't able to eradicate illegal drugs in Davao City. The, the city wherein he was mayor for more than two decades, and worse, his family is actually involved in the importation of uh, illegal drugs. I believe uh, that should resolve it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think the evidence is on the whole that war on crime policies tend to escalate violence. And there's very good research showing that when police use violence, they're more likely to have violence used against them, that it has this escalating tendency. But I was interested to ask about your reactions to the announcement of a preliminary examination um, and how to use this idea of the shadow of the ICC because I think what people don't realize is preliminary examination is, in, is really preliminary. So Afghanistan, where the um, Office of the Prosecutor has just announced that they are going to investigate, they had preliminary examination going through its multiple phases for a decade. And so I think it poses a lot of problems. It poses political problems, including internationally when you've got states in Africa threatening withdrawal from the Rome Statute. Um, so far, the United States has really not reacted at all um, to the Afghan investigation, I think, because it hasn't really landed on American soldiers yet. Um, but it's a huge question what happens if and when that happens. Um, you know, South Africa may, the Supreme Court there struck down legislation withdrawing from the court, but they're going to have another go at it, they're saying. So there's a lot of attacks on the court and potential allies for efforts to undermine it. Um, on the other hand, in the actual process of case building, um, we had a delegation of, of Philippine human rights organizations came to our office about a year ago. And they were explaining that in the post-Marcos era, many of them had kind of retooled to focus less on documentation of abuse and more on how do you strengthen democratic institutions. Which makes sense, right? But now, suddenly, they're thrown into this horrific cataclysm of violence with much less institutional ability to do <coughs> the kind of documentation on the ground, and especially in the areas where it's happening, where people you know, trying to collect evidence are in such danger themselves. Um, so I'm kind of interested in your own sort of thoughts on those aspects and, and particularly what, um, you know, politically or technically <coughs> international organizations like ours, like IPS <laughs> and others, uh, should be trying to do. do about, um, how should we think about this? How might we approach it? Well, the um, international uh, community has been uh, a big factor in the, in the stepping back of uh, Duterte in this war of drugs. Now, uh, you mentioned about the ICC. We, we filed the, the ICC as a last measure when uh, the lower house uh, of the Philippine Congress basically railroaded the uh, dismissal of the impeachment case against Mr. Duterte. We really wanted the, the democratic institutions domestically to work to rectify a problem such as Duterte. But uh, the uh, highly individualistic uh, or uh, nature of uh, Philippine politics um, uh, didn't allow us, uh, uh, didn't allow the, the institutions to work. So eventually we filed. Now the decision to to start the preliminary examination is a welcome development. It will jolt uh, Mr. Duterte into uh, realizing that uh, he, he's not above the law and uh, that he can be made accountable for his actions. Because prior to that, uh, he was acting like um, a tyrant that uh, he can do whatever he wants. Now this thing is dangling over his head. Um, publicly, he may appear um, uh, as uh, arrogant as always, but we know, uh, based on our sources in Malacanang, that uh, 
he's already shaking in his boots. Okay, and uh, that's still a positive thing for us. And it will also um, make them look back into uh, doing things uh, properly, hoping that uh, this thing will go away. And uh, the others who wouldn't want to be um, was this uh, implicated later on with these cases, they would now at least try to distance uh, themselves uh, in, in this policy of detention. Now, you, you, you mentioned about uh, violence, uh, begetting violence, and that uh, these policemen actually, um, once they have acquired the skill of killing, it's very difficult for them to stop. And this is one of the, uh, uh, the stories of uh, Mr. Las Cañas. <coughs> He started. He started killing as early as 19, late 1980s, and uh, he did it with a passion. He really believed in uh, Duterte, that he wanted to eradicate crime and uh, illegal drugs. That he was willing to burn in hell for for him. And uh, in one case, uh, when his brother was implicated in uh, illegal drugs, the the, the hit squad asked for his blessing if they can kill his brother and he gave it and uh, but later on when uh, they had this he had he faced this incident wherein they arrested or they apprehended this uh, shipment of illegal drugs and here comes the son of uh, Duterte asking him to release this uh, shipment so he got this illusion and that's the start of this uh, uh, but the, the, the point is, when he started killing early on, uh, he did it with a passion, and at some point, when the targets, when they ran out of, uh, of targets, the uh, prospect and the, of the contract killing came, because they already had the skill, and they were known to do such jobs, so eventually they were paid the uh, uh, money to to kill uh, people who are not uh, involved in any way, uh, in any crime, in any illegal drugs, but they would claim them as drug users and they would plant uh, uh, guns uh, as to, to justify the killings. And it's the similar pattern that's happening at the national level. So that's uh, a problem that's that we would deal with long after Duterte is, uh, is gone. Uh, sir, um, I think part of her question, she was raising the point about the timetable. If uh, this case, uh, ICC case with Duterte would drag on similar to other it cases. Will. Like, well, I mean, will. They all do. Well, so expectations management is really important. Yes. Um, but it's not think, speedy justice. Sorry. Uh, yeah, um, probably we we're expecting the worst, mm -hmm. but uh, still this is a welcome development. Mm -hmm. But uh, looking at the difference between the, these African uh, countries that you mentioned and the Philippines, is we still have uh, the media there mm -hmm. in place. They can they have been documenting all of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, Human Rights Watch was mm -hmm. uh, able to get uh, uh, so many. Uh, uh, so much information uh, about this, they have, and they have reported it. And uh, in our case, in my, my office, we were able to um, get hold of some of the witnesses and uh, so that at the proper time, they'll be able to tell their stories. So there's a major difference. In Africa, probably um, the ICC won't have access to such witnesses and, uh, and evidence, but in the Philippines, because of the pushback to the international, the presence of the international organizations, they're there. And uh, it's that the killings are happening um, in, in, in front of everyone. Thank you for your uh, presentation, Senator. Um, just wanted to, to ask about, like, the Philippines gives so much power to a person and less to its institutions. 
but that's a problem. He's a person. He's eventually gonna die, or he might be ousted, or impeached, or whatever. And um, if that happens, and we have, I think the country now has very less trust in like the, the justice system, Congress, the police, the worst. And if something happens to him, like you know, what's that? And the opposition is also very weak. So, and how how do we how does the, how will the country um, get it. out of a crisis that might happen? Because like you know, it, it might it, it might hit us like suddenly, and then suddenly we we don't even have like our Supreme Court, our our human rights agencies are being undermined, and, and so yeah. Well. Um Every day that uh, the death is in office is, uh, has uh, a negative effect on our society, on our country, for uh, years and decades to come. So, uh, but we have experiences, we have templates wherein we were able to recover, no matter how slowly, but eventually we did. Uh, in the case of, uh, of Duterte on the assumption that one day he gets either gets kicked out or gets arrested by the ICC, um, there would be um, again a there is a template on how we can get we build the pieces together. But of course we'll have to deal with the the appointees of uh, Mr. Duterte in the Supreme Court, just like what just like Here. We're, we're, yeah, Here. we're dealing with. Uh, the appointees of um, of Gloria Arroyo yeah. to the Supreme Court. So that uh, these are um, some of the things that we deal with. But still, it's going to be so much better to to than the situation right now, where he's creating so much uh, damage not only to the democratic institutions but to the Filipino values as well. Uh, you have children right now uh, openly was this uh, saying bad words and cursing everybody because they they see that in the president uh, so I don't know what's happening right now in uh, in uh, these homes yes yes Thank you so much. It's very good to see you again, Senator Turianis and Rita Garona Adkins. I listened to you in your presentation the other night, and uh, I'm here to learn some more. Especially, I'm a journalist, and if I may address again the same question that I had the privilege of asking you, with more enlightenment from the writings of, uh, of, of, of I, don't, I can't pronounce your name. San Help Ho. me, please. San, 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 San Ho Tree. San Ho. Sanho, that's right, yeah. Mr. Sanho, Dr. Sanho, whatever. <laughs> but anyway, I was very much moved by what you had said or written, that it's really economic, stupid. <laughs> In the Philippines, the drug problem is a question of economics. It's poverty. And Senator Rillanes, you had also addressed poverty as one of the trigger points that push uh, uh, among the factors, but probably a very main factor in a country that's still by Asian, Pacific, as well as world standards, is still below so far as economic output is concerned. My, uh, the, the question here, my, my focus here, to be kind of sh quick about it, is that uh, you're here precisely to uh, highlight precisely what's wrong in the Philippines so far as the policy regarding the drug problem and what's triggering it, etc., which is really very deplorable. Um, and the Filipinos here in the United States, other than being very moved and concerned by your very, you know, detailed, um, horrific examples of uh, what's happening there because of the policy of the present administration. Uh, the Filipinos here, while they're very moved, are also wanting to see as to how they can help. And uh, straight to the point is that they're very much encouraged by the fact that the U.S. Congress has a bill, 10, uh, Senate Bill 1055, which among other things addresses human rights, etc., and all that. 
uh, and also upgrading the military uh, to address precisely the security issues of the Philippines and the handling of social problems like the drug problem. But mainly, of course, and a highlight of it is that it also provides or it proposes uh, a $50 million, that's a lot of pesos, <laughs> uh, to develop a public health approach or a public health program to deal with the problem in the Philippines. Now, if I, just very quickly from what I read from the literature of the human rights movement, uh, 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 is that something like about out of the thousands, probably now 12,000, but when I was there during the first half of uh, President Duterte in 2010, I happened to be in the Philippines in just about a short while, the first six months, about 7,000 7, people were killed at that time. Uh, but anyway, the point is that one third apparently are children or age 15 to 9 to 15 years old. And these are the future leaders of a country like, I mean, the Philippines. So now, uh, uh, tying it up to the U.S. Senate Bill 1025, which allocates 50 million dollars, do, uh, do, dollars, pesos, that would be 48 to a dollar, that's a lot of pesos, um, precisely to develop a public health approach. Um, I would like to be able to pursue that senator uh, with perhaps Mr. Sanjo's uh, comments as to how, if that money, uh, if, if the bill passes and it's an aid through the U.S. Department, the USAID and stuff like that, and naturally it will have to be to deal with the public sector as well as the private sector. Now, how would that be, uh, be implemented if you could sort of enlighten us some more uh, well, about that? Uh, as, as I Even if just speculatively. Uh, on the assumption that uh, that bill gets passed, then uh, we get uh, $50 million. As I mentioned earlier, Mr. Duterte has no comprehensive uh, drug, uh, anti-illegal drug program. It's just oh, about case. Okay. So they would, wouldn't know what to do with the money. Probably by default, it would go to the Department of Health, but there are no uh, was this uh, rehabilitation centers enough to cover the whole country? They probably have uh, several controlled by the department, but uh, it's nowhere near accessible or uh, uh, practical for um, the people in the provinces to, to even uh, avail of. The one that they have constructed in the in Meba Isiha is supposed to be a 10,000 bed uh, rehabilitation facility mm -hmm. uh, only has probably more than a hundred people um, at the moment and you, it, it's not even wise to create uh, such a big uh, facility imagine 10,000 drug users uh, commingling <laughs> coming <-ling. laughs> and uh, they probably pass around their different contacts in different places so but anyway, bottom line is we wouldn't know what to do with that money. Uh, there's no, there's no other policy that came. So just to follow up, you know this. Uh, they claim that how many people surrendered, how many drug addicts surrendered? Where did they go? Where did they go, and what kind of rehab? I mean, is there some? A record uh, well, here's the thing. They did that only for propaganda purposes again, because in so many cases, what they what they did was they call on the community leaders would call on the residents to um, to assemble in a um, uh, covered court or a gymnasium, uh, supposedly or uh, ostensibly for some program. So they would, they would come, and when they're already there, they would be forced to sign that uh, they are users, uh, that uh, they have surrendered themselves voluntarily. If they refuse, then they would now be included in, that, in the list. So a lot of 
of uh, Filipinos just signed their names there. Again, I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned, there was no program, there's no follow, follow through, follow, follow up in, in these cases. In um, some instances, they, they are, uh, what's this, advertising this Zumba uh, program, but of course, these are just uh, entirely for propaganda purposes. But, Nothing's happening to them. I, ju I just wonder on that if we could push it a little further, though, and say how oh, you've watched this in other countries, because it's fascinating what you put forward. In 1989 to 1994, a bunch of us here worked with counterparts in the Philippines to get $25 million of U.S. aid. Mm -hmm. And I remember, Rita, you, you were, you were yeah, writing then uh, about this. But it was an innovative approach to not have it go to the federal government. $25 million was sent to the Philippines to endow a foundation. It was actually around the environment. And then, uh, in that case, nonprofit a foundation was set up there. The $25 million endowed it. And, and people brought proposals to a foundation with good NGO leaders at the top of it. And a lot of good money was used on good things. And I'll just point out, Sanho has been meeting here. Whenever delegations of Filipino mayors and provincial officials come here, Sanho's been meeting with them. They're asking the same things you both asked. What can we do at the city level? What can we do at the provincial level? And it's an interesting question whether somehow, if monies were given, either by the US government or the European Union, you could have them steered to people who could, who were in a position to do things at the, at the municipal or provincial um, level. Probably not at the Senate. Because yeah. we don't have, uh, we wouldn't have that power. Right. It's yeah. still uh, that power would be yeah. referred to the president. Yeah. Now uh, I I agree it would have been wiser to just funnel these uh, funds to NGOs uh, because that's uh, more direct in, yeah. in terms of uh, coming out with a specific output. The uh, the Catholic Church right now has been. Uh, very active in uh, the rehabilitation of uh, some of these uh, surrenderies. And uh, mm -hmm. they have also become the refuge of uh, the witnesses. Uh, so when the time comes, the Catholic Church will be uh, lining up these witnesses uh, against uh, Mr. Duterte. But uh, again, these, these efforts are being done and dependent totally of uh, the government agencies. Okay. Just a quick follow-up, sir, if I may. Well, yeah, wait, and, we, oh. and I know you have a question too. I'm oh, sorry. But yeah, should we should we maybe come back to you, Rita, after we make sure everybody has a chance? To, uh, <coughs> I'm Bambi Lorca. I'm a holistic pediatrician. Thank you for coming, Senator. Um, I uh, I was privileged to have been part of. Uh, um, about a year ago, um, the Secretary of Health sent a team here to figure out how to. Uh, the current she's not she's no longer Secretary of Health. She sent a team here to try to figure out what to do with the with the um, with drug rehabilitation. So there was a certain group that that worked on that, and um, so I well I wonder if that's still going on. And number two. Um, Senator, uh, Secretary Cayetano came here uh, mm -hmm. a few months ago and he brought along a uh, PIDEA chief who was supposed to have taken over from the Philippine National Police. And so we were a little bit more hopeful at that time. But since then we've heard that he's been accused of, uh, of things so that he's no longer in charge of the drug war. Um, do you mind enlightening us? as that's concerned. Um, and I also lobby in Congress and in the Senate, and 1055, they tie that with uh, with uh, PNP being in charge of of, uh, of the drug war. So with PDEA being in charge now, or I don't know if that's changed, they're not able to work on it. Um, thank you, Senator. Um, allow me to, in answering your question, uh, allow me to paint a just a quick uh, picture of the uh, ecosystem of the drug problem. Um, in the Philippines, we passed three laws 
to address the problem. Uh, one was to criminalize uh, a set of uh, uh, drugs. Uh, two, to create agencies to take the place of uh, previously uh, what we call a narcotics command, which was so corruption riddled. Uh, that's why it, uh, they took away the drug problem from the national police and they transferred it to a, a civilian agency similar to the USDEA. We call it the PIDEA, Philippine Drug Enforcement Administration. Mm -hmm. uh, they're supposed to be at the top of uh, our anti-drug uh, policy and all other agencies, including the PNP, are just enforcement agencies to be directed by the uh, PIDEA at the regulatory level and at the policy level by what we call the drug uh, uh, DDB, the Dangerous Drugs Board. Now, um, and this would be close to the heart of Sanho, what has happened under Duterte in the guise of coming up with a uh, drug war to address supposedly the drug uh, problem, uh, it was actually just a veneer for, uh, for the big picture, and the big picture was total control. The drug war was just uh, a, 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 a uh, smoke screen. And how do we say this? And the proof of that is one, we don't even have a fully enunciated, a document that would spell out as if it is the national uh, drug control strategy. We don't have that. The U.S. has that. Uh, so for, supposedly for a president who's uh, campaign was buttressed by a, a drug anti-drug campaign. It doesn't even have an anti-drug strategy. Second, uh, as opposed to the global uh, phenomenon of harm reduction, which is supposed to be the way to go in addressing drugs, you took away the drug campaign from agencies mandated by law, through laws passed by Congress, you took that away from them and you gave it to the PNP which was supposed to address street-level uh, drugs. And how is the PNP tooled? It's supposed to uh, address this through uh, law enforcement. And you know what happens there. If you don't have a holistic program, you, you, it's, uh, it's as if you present a, a nail to a carpenter. The carpenter does with the nail hammers it down. That's what the PNP did. So you now have, you, wrap, you have racked up uh, more than 10,000 drug deaths precisely be, because of that simple policy change. Uh, that said, another proof that there is no comprehensive uh, drug control strategy, it was only in uh, the budget hearings of 2017 when the Department of Health officially asked for a budget for demand control. When you have a drug control strategy, you're supposed to have both demand control and supply control. They were primarily uh, addressing the demand side by killing the addicts. And, uh, and you, would, you were hoping that they would do something with the control, oh, sorry, with the uh, supply side. And guess what? The biggest drug scandal happened precisely in this administration which was supposed to be fighting drugs and no less than the son of the president gets dragged into the whole mess imagine 6.4 billion and only 6.4 billion out of four times that which was not intercepted only 6.4 billion in one shipment was intercepted the drug shipment from china alone was four times that but only one fourth of that was intercepted 6.4 billion pesos no less than our own customs that's where they passed it through our customs front door front door they didn't even do it back door so uh, that tells you about where the the you know the the mind is of the administration when it comes to controlling drugs no it's not about controlling drugs it's about controlling it's about control not controlling drugs, it's about power, not about taking care of the people. So that is the ecosystem now. That is that is precisely why uh, 50 million, as Rita said, uh, and as the senator said, we fear that this is good money that might go to waste. So before any of that money ever leaves the US, they might as well ask 
not the DOH, not anybody, ask the, ask the government first. How are you going to use this money exactly. in terms of first? First and foremost, the cornerstone of that money should be harm reduction. It's not, not a single dollar should go into any of these tactics that instead of um, you know protecting our citizens, both the users as well as the, uh, the innocents, from harm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I, I think it, it should be, uh, anyway, th that has always been the case of the donor. The donor can make certain demands, and in this case, exactly. those demands are reasonable. Exactly. And in fact, they are proper. But uh, Duterte would reject any grant with uh, demands, oh, with, demand, with conditions. conditions yeah. Now, uh, let me just address that portion of the question we're in. Uh, for example, if the DOH would embark on this rehabilitation component of the drug problem, well, to be honest, we don't have the infrastructure for that. Ideally, we should have one, deten one rehabilitation center per municipality. Um, but we don't have that. Then you should have uh, the appropriate number of psychologists per rehabilitation center so that they can uh, professionally guide them into the rehabilitation process. We don't have enough psychologists either. Uh, I should know, I, I chair the committee on uh, professional uh, regulation. So these are the challenges that we have. Until we come up with that comprehensive uh, the policy against uh, or addressing the drug problem, which would involve all these components from the supply side, the uh, uh, demand side, the enforcement side, and uh, uh, what's this? Rehabilitation. The, uh, the rehabilitation side. So all of these things should be clearly defined. We don't have that, and we won't be having that uh, for as long as the data is around. So, but still, we would welcome any aid coming from the United States. Uh, but hopefully, it goes to good use. So I'm going to address that, the, the question we'd asked earlier about uh, what, how to approach this. Um, I would start with the words of President Duterte himself. About a year ago, last December, he, uh, on camera, talked about his own use of his favorite drug, which is fentanyl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If anyone knows anything about fentanyl, that's the number one killer in the United States right now. It's not heroin, it's synthetic opioid fentanyl that is killing people, right? It's 50 times more powerful than heroin. President Duterte had a motorcycle accident a few years ago. His doctor prescribed a fentanyl patch, transdermal patch. And he said they use one quarter of the patch. President Duterte openly bragged about how he loved it, and he used the full patch, four times the, the prescribed dosage. His doctor cut him off. He said, you're abusing this very dangerously. Uh, but he said, very interestingly, on camera, he says, you may not know what paradise is like, but I've been there. And he's talking about his little, you know, drug experiences. Now, imagine if you're a powerful person with all sorts of wealth and opportunity and everything going your side, and you, you crave this paradise. Imagine if you're not that person. Imagine if you are the type of people that are being killed in this drug war, which are, in the United States is mostly about race, right, and, and poverty. In the Philippines is about poverty. These are the poorest of the poor who are being exterminated. And if you didn't have anything to look forward to tomorrow, the best prevention message I can think of is to give people a reason to look forward to tomorrow. I know that sounds simplistic, but there is no substitute for building a healthy society at the end of the day. And in the United States, we've tried for decades to try to coerce people out of using drugs. In some of the worst uh, situations of both urban and rural deprivation, uh, they don't believe the partner will be a better day. Their best days are behind them. And we say to them, you need to be sober and have no job and no hope and no future and no opportunity. This is not a sustainable policy. So I would pose a radical idea, which is to ask the users themselves, uh, talk to them. Well, one of the interesting things I did 20 years ago when I began looking at this problem in, in Baltimore in some of the roughest neighborhoods, I worked with the Quaker organization, uh, the American Friends Service Committee, uh, and they had this thing called a listening project. This radical idea that the neighborhood could tell you a lot more than the police could tell you, or that President Duterte could tell you with his, his cornerstone of lies. This idea that if you smoke shabu for more than six months, your brain shrinks to the size of a baby is not based on any evidence whatsoever anywhere in the world. It's total fantasy. Uh, but the idea that the users themselves might explain to you what they're missing in their lives and what it takes to build a healthier society. Otherwise, you're basically shoveling water, uh, it seems to me.
uh, that yes, harm reduction is very, very important, especially in the interim uh, period, right, to minimize the harms caused by these drugs as well as the harms caused by the war on drugs. And if you Google harm reduction and methamphetamine, it's, it's too much to get into right now, but the, you'll find some, some good suggestions there that don't cost a lot of money. Uh, but ultimately, I think it's got to do with building a healthy society and dealing with the inequalities uh, and, and the structural problems that are being scapegoated upon these drug users. So perhaps, I wonder if you could talk about what is it like for people who haven't been to the Philippines or haven't experienced the, 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 you know, the, the, the social strata that's being targeted. What is it like for people, day-to-day uh, -day life? Well, um, the, the urban poor, uh, it's a hand-to-mouth existence. Of course, for ex extreme cases, you have kids uh, sniffing rugby. Uh, do they call that rugby here? Uh, solvent screw. Yeah, solvent screw. Yeah, glue sniffing. Yeah, glue sniffing. So they, they sniff uh, the solvents uh, to escape hunger and uh, poverty and uh, they float around, uh, walk around the streets uh, high all throughout the day. So that's the, the extreme case. But uh, for most cases, as again, I, I cite the statistics that the majority of uh, drug users are mainly marijuana users. And one time, users, those who experimented, then uh, they didn't touch uh, drugs anymore. They, they were part of that 1.8%. Uh, and the uh, recreational users, uh, probably those uh, in clubs, the kids, uh, so they, they're part of, of that. But only those who are hooked um, would number around 100,000. So they're scattered all over, all over the country. Now, there is poverty uh, in the Philippines, but um, Filipinos in general are, are good-natured, and uh, we can find Forms of different forms of recreation, and uh, You're not high in the happiness index. Yeah, and oh happiness. yeah, you guys are number one on the happiness index. And, and Russia, uh, Philippines, <laughs> <laughs> everything else. <laughs> and uh, the resorting to illegal drugs is, is not is not the first option. Um, they they do other uh, other stuff. That's why I, I agree if we create an environment where, wherein they can channel their, uh, uh, their energies and uh, their hopes to, then we can help them get out of, uh, out of this uh, problem. So, yeah. I'm just wondering, I know we don't have much time left, and I do realize just one unique thing about you being here, Senator Trianis, and your background is I mean, this is, I mean, I think both Filipinos in this country and allies, like places like IPS and the, and the Justice Initiative of the Open Society Institute and all, we, we both want to help in the short term, and we also, anyone here who's over 50 did live through the Marcos dictatorship, so we're also trying to prepare for how we could help there. And I'm just curious if you could quickly say, you described this creeping dictatorship. When I was there last summer, the worry was maybe he would spread the Declaration of Martial Law that is in Mindanao to the whole country. And I'm curious if you could say, um, in a moment like that, clearly all of these connections you're making hopefully are helpful, but I'm curious from your experience in the military, one, do you think the military would go along with that, or would they step up and be part of a democracy counter to that, um, and just any other thoughts at that moment on, on how people in this country could, could help. Okay, um, let's talk about scenarios. The, the scenario that you painted that uh, the nationwide partial law uh, option uh, or the revolutionary government option, these options are still in play. Duterte wants it. Uh, he's the, that's the ideal scenario for him. Now, the question is whether he would pull the trigger uh, or not, and if so, when. I believe the primary consideration of Duterte is whether the armed forces would follow him. That's his concern. So to help resolve that, he increased their salary. 
hoping that uh, this uh, gesture would turn, would be reciprocated uh, through blind loyalty of uh, some sort. But Duterte being paranoid, as uh, what we have uh, profiled him to be, he, he doesn't uh, issue orders directly because being a former prosecutor and at the same time paranoid, he knows that the direct order is the biggest evidence against him. So what he does uh, is to float the idea, to run, hoping that his rabid followers would take the initiative and get uh, and do the ends uh, that, that he wants. But in a, a case like uh, declaring a revolutionary government, he would need to give that order. So, but remember his experience with Mr. Las Cañas, he has uh, cultivated that relationship for decades and still this guy turned on him. So it uh, actually aggravates his, uh, his paranoia. Now, from uh, those uh, aware of how, of how the military works, the missions are given directly. It's, it's not floated around. So I believe these are factors that are, are saving us for the moment. But then the question is, assuming that he masters enough courage to give that order would the armed forces follow uh, I believe right now because of the pressure from the different uh, institutions and sectors like uh, the church civil society uh, the business community the international organizations they have person-to-person -person relationships with the top brass of uh, the armed forces so they won't they won't um, the rank and file right now is a great majority of the rank and file is for Duterte, but they will still follow the commanders. Let me cite an example. Back in 2001, during the uh, what we call the Edsa II Revolution, the armed forces of the Philippines was predominantly for Arab Estrada because he supported the, the all-out war in Mindanao, um, he gave incentives to the soldiers, so the sympathies are, for, are, are with him. But because of the uh, political exposure of the, the leadership, and eventually these person-to-person -person, uh, relationships pulled them into withdrawing support, the rest of the armed forces followed without any question. In, in my case, uh, when I was uh, back then, I was still a Navy lieutenant and I was watching the, um, the uh, impeachment trial of uh, Arab Estrada. Um, my biases were for uh, Estrada. I, I may not be as vocal as the enlisted men because they were really cheering for him. But uh, I, I felt that uh, he was good uh, for the armed forces. But then my, my, my boss said, um, one day he called for me and asked me, uh, Sonny, you, uh, will you join me if I go to the other side? Without any hesitation, I answered, yes, sir, regardless of my biases. Mm -hmm. So he immediately gave me instructions that I would be the liaison officer to the, uh, the camp as he defected and uh, we drew support. That's how it goes. <laughs> that, that's how it goes. Yeah. You follow. Yeah. So that now how you help, uh, you can, um, uh, in this, we are preparing actually for this scenario. The first half of the year is very, very critical for us because we feel that Duterte is getting more and more paranoid and therefore more and more dangerous, more and more desperate. He may pull the trigger in this period. So we are preparing for that. Um, we still have uh, an extensive network in the armed forces. So we are cultivating uh, those relationships. Um, so, but um, for the 
the other um, officers, they're very uh, socially aware, politically and socially aware. If the international community are expressive in their uh, criticisms against the Duterte administration, all of these things are are uh, accumulated uh, at the subconscious because they would, at the end of the day, they would do the right thing. Now, if in their minds, in their, if in their subconscious, it's clearly defined that following Duterte is not the right thing, then they will not follow. Thank you. This is extremely helpful, and I know our time, official time, is up, although if people have further questions, maybe they can stick around a bit. But Samo, is there any anything you want to say just to end some? Boy, I wish you good luck and, and good safety. Um, you know, safety. It, there's a lot of um, uh, parallels. There's a lot of facile comparisons between Trump and Duterte, but there's also a lot of similarities that are really, really troubling in that Duterte had a six-month head start in terms of coming into office uh, versus Trump's election. But the things that we are worried about here in the United States, about lock her up, uh, you know, Duterte did that to Senator De Lima. She's been behind bars and trumped up charges for a year now, and he's gotten away with it. Uh, the fake news, the, you know, uh, the scapegoating, the uh, scapegoating on the drug users. Trump is doing that with MS-13 this past week. You've seen everything. Every person who speaks Spanish has been reduced to a member of MS-13 now. And the tendency yeah. to create the magic. Yes. Watch this hand while this other hand is yes. doing something else. Yes. So if you're interested in Trumpism, if you're worried about that, pay attention to the Philippines because it's a good preview and, and a bit of a roadmap in some of these, uh, how, how authoritarianism uh, we may soon be joining the axis of authoritarians if we don't act. That's it. Thank you for standing up for <laughs> for democracy. Yeah. yeah. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.